I'm a gastroenterologist and I've been uh, working in the field of gastroenterology since the late 1980s when I trained and I've worked not only in Western Australia but in South Australia, the United States and the UK. So I've travelled around a bit and worked with lots of groups and essentially most of the work that I do is in the field of uh, primarily liver disease and my favourite liver disease has always been hemochromatosis and I do a lot of research in the field of well, two main areas, iron metabolism, so primarily the effects of too much iron, but we're now seeing lots of interesting stuff emerging on the role of iron in other areas, all the way from its effect on health in athletes, for example, through to its impact on exercise and obesity and other common liver diseases like fatty liver disease, its influence on cancer. So I've sort of broadened out, and the research really spans everything from the cell level so that we do in a laboratory right through to the population level and a lot of the time what we're looking for is new knowledge that we can impart pretty quickly that changes the way either the community responds to or the doctors that care to the, for the community use to pick things up and do things about it a lot earlier so we don't see people becoming unwell with the conditions that I'm interested in. And the other big area I work in is liver injury and liver disease in general and how the liver responds to injury and why we develop scarring and cancer because it's such a big uh, problem now globally. Um, so they're the, the areas that I work in and I see patients in private practice. I see them at the hospital and uh, most of the work that I do now is sort of creating a, a department that's cohesive and uh, built for the future so we can train specialists and continue their education not only in their specialties but make sure they understand about research and can ask questions and answer questions for the future because that's how we advance our health care. So it starts in one of two ways. The patient can come along and say look you know I've got a, a range of symptoms or I wonder if I might have hemochromatosis because the general public's a lot more educated about what's going on out there and people will google it and and uh, be in chat groups and so it could come as straight up as doc could I have hemochromatosis or it, it could present as other members in my family have got it I don't know whether I've got it or not I don't feel particularly unwell but how do I find out if I've got it or they might have some symptoms, you know, feel unwell, and the common sorts of symptoms are those of non-specific things like fatigue and lethargy or achy joints. They're the commonest sorts of symptoms. And then more uncommonly, we'll find some clinical signs, you know, uh, some evidence of liver disease or some evidence of arthritis or, and very rarely now, pigmentation. And of course, pigmentation is tricky to sort of pick in a country like ours where there's so much sunshine and everybody basically gets pigmented but if you were living in the north of Norway and you had someone who's pigmented you'd be a bit suspicious that there was something else other than sunshine causing that. So it can present in many different ways and that's why in the past it's been an easy diagnosis to miss. There's been a lot of education put in over the last 20 or 30 years to reverse that and now the problem we see isn't so much people not being aware of it so much but over interpreting results of tests and thinking there are more people out there with hemochromatosis sometimes than there really are. And so it's a matter of striking the right balance and getting people to understand which tests to interpret and how. Challenges, so you can divide up into understanding what the disease is and how it affects them. There's so much you can find on the internet uh, that you know can be true or tell porky pies or whatever. So it's important to know where to go for information and having I think organisations like you know, Hemochromatosis Australia or similar groups internationally where they can go and get you know, well-vetted information that paints the real picture. So information, so you understand what you've got. Finding healthcare professionals who understand the disease and can answer your questions. Um, getting into treatment as early as possible. And understanding what the other things you need to do are after you make the diagnosis. So when you're diagnosed, there's a possibility other members in your family need to be treated. And so the process of actually telling the, your other family members, given the complexities of how people interact with each other, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not, and ensuring that they go off and have the opportunity to be screened for the disease and therefore treated and prevent chronic conditions occurring. We also know that 
um, patients with hereditary hemochromatosis do have an increased risk compared to the age match control population for things like breast cancer and bowel cancer. And so what we generally would do now is make sure that all people understand that if you've got hemochromatosis, we tell everybody now over the age of 50 to make sure you're participating in breast cancer and bowel cancer screening, while a hemochromatosis patient really needs to make sure they do do that. But whether that's the National Bowel Cancer Screening Program, mammography or other sorts of screening, it depends on the other characteristics the patient has. So if you have a family history of bowel cancer and you've got hemochromatosis, well, you definitely want to make sure that you're probably uh, at least doing national bowel cancer screening and then probably considering colonoscopy screening, which would be the national you know, gold standard of care for people with uh, high-risk sorts of conditions. Hemochromatosis isn't specifically mentioned in the new can colorectal cancer screening guidelines, but nonetheless, it's the sort of conversation you should have with your doctor about what is best for you in the context of your hemochromatosis and any other risk factors that you've got. Mainly, I mean, if you're coming with symptoms, I worry about how they feel and the main concerns are, look, am I going to get better? Can I get back to normal? Um, and so they're the sorts of things you go through and a lot of the time, you know, we say, look, there's at least a 70, 80% chance if you're feeling fatigued and lethargic that you're going to get better with this treatment. It's amazing how influential your psyche is on how you feel. So if I sit there and say, you might get better or not, that's going to have a very different effect to me sort of encouraging, saying, look, there's a very good chance you're going to get better because the fatigue and lethargy that we see that's so common in the population, if you've got hemochromatosis, yes, it could be the disease that you've got, but there may be other causes to it too. And, you know, the stresses of the world that we live in and all those sorts of things can contribute to those symptoms as well. So I think having a good positive interaction with the clinician who's seeing you, who can convey a sense of you know confidence about, I know what I'm talking about, so that people can go away and get on with their lives because this isn't the sort of condition that people should be lumbered with and to suffer with. This is the sort of condition we should get on top of and essentially return people to complete normality and get on with whatever your life needs to be. So, you know, I think you need that sort of confidence in whoever's seeing you. If you know about hemochromatosis, you'll know about it. And it sounds a bit Rumsfeldish, but if you don't know about it and you don't know it exists, then it's very difficult to make the diagnosis. But for the majority of people who aren't aware of it, and are just a bit unsure about how to go about diagnosing it. There are healthcare pathways that exist within Australia that all GPs have access to, which are published by the health department, and there are pathways that walk the GP through, or in fact any clinician through, how to make the diagnosis, how to treat, what to investigate, what tests to do, and they're all fairly standardised, so they're out there already. So if you don't know what to do, look up the healthcare pathway, and I think it's listed under the blood diseases section where you find hemochromatosis, and then just follow it, it'll walk you through it. There are some new um, things that we've learned about hemochromatosis. For example, um, every year in Australia, there's over 12 million full blood count tests done, just blood tests to check your blood counts and hemoglobins for a whole range of reasons. As it turns out, one of the manifestations of hemochromatosis that's present probably from childhood onwards, is your red cells, your red blood cells will be larger than anybody else's. And often what we're looking for in a blood count is, you know, is your haemoglobin low? What are your cell counts and things like that? And we don't pay much attention to other elements of it. So if you have a full blood count and your red blood cells are larger than the average, and uh, there are some numbers that have been published, but I won't go into the numbers because that, that, that doesn't that's all provided on the healthcare pathway now, we can enrich for the diagnosis of haemochromatosis. So if GPs are doing blood tests and they're seeing, you know, abnormal parameters on blood cell size that are larger than normal and you happen to be from northern European origin, that sort of person might benefit from assessment of heme for a haemochromatosis. And the, the odds of finding haemochromatosis in that group of patients is exactly the same as, for example, if you came along and saw me today and you had a brother and a sister or a couple of brothers, I would tell you that they should be screened for haemochromatosis because there's about a one in four chance that they might have the same disease. 
if your red cells are larger than normal, there's a one in four chance you've got hemochromatosis. So it's the same probability. So if we say, what do we normally do? We would tell you to be screened. Well, this is another clue for screening. That's a new thing. It's only just been published this year, but it's been built into the healthcare pathways. And it's just another tool to help medical practitioners who are ordering tests get the most out of the tests that they're ordering already um, to value add to that whole process. In the iron world, there's a lot of activity. There's a lot of activity in understanding the pathways that regulate iron, uptake and transport and excretion from the body because there are a number of disease processes, not just hemochromatosis, which could be helped by better knowledge. So there's a lot of people who are deficient in iron, for example, and understanding the pathways by which iron gets in and stored and used in the body ultimately leads to knowing how you can actually improve the uptake of iron. So for those people who have too little, we could maybe come up with new treatments to correct that. For those that have too much, under, understanding pathways of how to get iron out of the body when you can't have phlebotomy therapy to remove the iron because you might have heart disease or something else contraindicating the use of removing blood from you, well, there may be new ways to stop iron being absorbed, so what we call iron chelation in the bowel, or remove from the body using other sorts of drugs. And there are drugs that have been developed which can bind iron in the body and then excrete it either through the, the bile or the urine. They're less effective than taking blood from people, but they're an alternative when you can't have that done. And then there's a lot of interest in the role of iron in cancer now. So what we know globally is that as your blood iron levels increase, and I'm not even talking about iron overload here, but as they get to the top of what we accept is the normal range, your risk for uh, common cancers such as uh, liver cancer and breast cancer increase. And it's seen in multiple countries now, so it's a real observation. And so whether in fact things that relate to how much iron is in our environment, in our diet, in us, needs to be really looked at. Because if you think about it, globally, we tend to iron supplement all foods. Now, that might be perfectly relevant in countries which do suffer from high rates of iron deficiency and don't have good food. In Western countries, though, we have the opposite problem that we're suffering with overnutrition. And maybe, and if you think about it, women have always had lower iron stores than men. I know we're in a world of equity these days, but it may actually not be sensible to try and overcorrect iron levels in women because it could be that, in fact, there might be a bioprotective thing going on in relation to breast cancer. We don't know whether reducing iron levels in women will protect against breast cancer, for example, but there is data that shows if you reduce iron levels in the general population, you can reduce cancer risks. And so there's a big study that we're doing at the moment with a group in New South Wales uh, on a group called the 45 and Up study, which has over 200,000 Australians in it. They've been studied for at least 10 years, so it's probably the largest population study that's ever been done. And one of the outcomes from that is to look at cancer and other diseases. And we're looking at whether those that donate blood regularly actually have reduced rates of cancer compared to those that don't, to try and give us an idea about whether in fact reducing iron might be beneficial. So as you can see, there are some potential big public health uh, issues that will be answered by research into the future that relate to iron. And something that we've just recently observed, and this will come out in the press in probably about two to three weeks' time, is that for individuals who are overweight, and especially, so if you think about it, 70% of the Australian population is overweight, 30% is obese. Of people who are overweight or obese, 60% of them have what we call fatty liver. And one of the big difficulties we have in the Australian community is if you tell people to lose weight, you might tell them what to eat, tell them what to do, tell them how to exercise. It often is ineffective, or if it works, it lasts for a little period of time. And one of the big um, things people often complain about is this fatigue or lethargy. They don't want to do things. As it turns out, one of the reasons behind that, uh, and this will come out in the work we've just completed based on the RAIN study here in Perth, is that even for adolescents who are otherwise healthy, 
as you gain weight and as you get a fatty liver, your ability to make normal-sized red cells diminishes. So your red cells are smaller with less hemoglobin in them, less able to carry oxygen, and possibly that's a sign that there's less iron available to you for other metabolic purposes. And one of the main roles that iron has in the cells, and we don't have a good blood test to measure this, is that it's involved in the production of energy. So if you do not have enough iron available in your cells, you don't burn oxygen to make energy for the cells. Um, that's why athletes, for example, go to altitude to train to improve hemoglobin and oxygen burn and things like that. And that may be part of the reason why overweight people and people with fatty liver feel very lethargic, don't exercise, don't lose weight. So one of the areas in the future for looking at is if we can treat that, make iron more available to people who are overweight, will they actually get up and exercise more because it's much more feasible for the Australian community for people to get up and exercise more and lose weight than to look at medications, pills, surgery and all those expensive things which we really as a nation probably can't afford or if you're going to do it then you'd have to pay for it yourself type thing. So I think there's a lot of work to come out of the iron area. The other big area where iron is playing a role at the moment where there's a lot of interest is in the Alzheimer's disease area where people are wondering does iron contribute to the development of Alzheimer's or not. I think the jury's out on that. We've done population level work here in Western Australia with the Bustleton study looking at iron levels and cognitive impairment and haven't found an association. But there may well be some approaches to treatment in the future that do possibly relate to manipulating iron deposition in the brain, but I think we've got to wait for that to go through. So iron is certainly alive and well on a number of fronts and the only reason we know as much about iron as we do is because it came to our attention through hemochromatosis. So hemochromatosis, if you like, the, the grandfather of all the knowledge that we know that relates to iron because it's the disease that made people need to study it. Probably the easiest thing in a web-based world now is if you go to Hemochromatosis Australia, you'll find lots of information there. There are uh, other professional societies that provide information as well but you know often I like to keep things simple so Hemochromatosis Australia start there there's also people you can talk to there if you've got concerns so if you don't feel or you don't have access to a medical practitioner or need to do some just digging around for yourself to get yourself to the point where you think right now I need to go off and do something about this that's where you would start here in Australia. Mm -hmm.